Thank you very much uh, all for joining us here today. Uh, we're expecting um, uh, some more people to trickle in, but um, they will as, as we go on. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Moeed Yusuf. I am a uh, South Asia advisor here at USIP and I work on, on Pakistan. Um, today's event, uh, just to give you a background, uh, USIP is an independent bipartisan um, institution. And as um, we look at various issues in South Asia and specifically me uh, in Pakistan, we try and discuss various issues of intellectual but also policy importance. Um, and being an independent institution, we uh, try and put forth uh, whichever views uh, there are out there, the whole spectrum of the views. The USIP uh, being uh, an independent think tank does not decide, does not provide you any definitive words, uh, but it's panelists who come together and present their own views um, in their personal capacities as uh, all, all of uh, the panelists today would be doing uh, on various issues. Um, today's uh, topic, Balochistan, um, is interesting in the way that um, a lot is said about it, but there is not enough, if I may say, um, intellectual uh, capacity and uh, research which has been done on this issue to understand just exactly what the ground situation is, um, how Pakistan, um, uh, the, the, the province, this province of Pakistan uh, is situated, and what its potential is uh, in terms of both the region and uh, for the state of Pakistan. You know, you hear often about turbulence in Balochistan, uh, a nationalist movement, uh, violence, and then um, there is also the positive aspect, which is if you really want to see South Asia stabilize, there is the energy corridor, uh, there is tremendous economic potential tying Afghanistan to Pakistan to India to perhaps uh, even further east. Um, and so there are these you know, two poles uh, of, of uh, visions and views uh, for Balochistan. Uh, ultimately, as USIP, as we see um, everything from a conflict resolution lens, and the question becomes, how do you bring peace to a region uh, which has over one-fifth of the world's population? Uh, how do you see uh, people in the region um, grow and states prosper? So with that background, let me briefly introduce the panel to you. Um, we are going to have four speakers, each speaking for about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Um, our first speaker, um, uh, uh, Salik Harrison, uh, would unfortunately have to leave uh, shortly after he speaks, uh, but the other three will be there uh, to the end to, to answer questions. Um, let me also very briefly introduce all four of them uh, in the beginning. Um, there are bios outside, so I wouldn't go into the complete details, uh, but just to, to give everybody a sense, not that any of, of, of them need any introduction. Um, uh, Mr. Salik Harrison is the director of the Asia program at the Center for International Policy and a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He is specialized in South Asia and East Asia um, and has been working uh, on the region uh, for 50 years, first as a journalist and also as a scholar, uh, and is an author uh, of at least five books. And he's worked on Balochistan extensively. Um, professor Marvin Weinbaum, and, and I do this in no particular order, um, is a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he had a long and distinguished career as a professor, and is also a scholar in residence at the Middle East Institute, um, previously worked at the State Department as well, uh, and if anybody studies uh, South Asia, especially Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, you would not have missed his name. Um, Shahzadi Beg uh, is a barrister based in London with over 15 years of experience in criminal and human rights law uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, she has held various judicial positions in Britain and regularly sits as an immigration judge uh, in the country. Um, she has been, uh, uh, she's been working on Pakistan's uh, legal sector for a long, long time. And um, the reason I was um, desperate to get her on the panel is that she was in Balochistan as part of a fact-finding uh, mission uh, last year and spent some time in the province, so has uh, information from the ground. 
Uh, finally, Mr. Ijaz Heather, who um, is a long-time journalist uh, and a defense analyst, contributing editor to the Friday Times, um, was also the op-ed editor of the Daily Times, which is one of the major papers. Uh, he's been a Ford Scholar at the University of Illinois. He's been, been at the Brookings Institution. Um, very well known both uh, in Pakistan and here. And again, I want to stress that I know of no other person who spent more time uh, intellectually analyzing Balochistan than Mr. Heather in the past year and a half. Uh, I don't exactly know, but I think eight to 10 visits and uh, you know, has gone across the province to see the situation. So we've got real ground truthing knowledge here, which is very rare uh, for, for um, issues as contested, uh, contested as Balochistan. So let me, without further ado, turn to uh, Mr. Harrison to, to have his uh, opening comments. He had indicated he would speak, speak for about 10 minutes, and uh, we'll take it from there. Sir. Thank you so much. Why does Baluchistan matter to the United States? I will present four reasons. First, because the six million Baluch in Pakistan, there are, of course, or in Iran, are the victims of the worst human rights abuses since Mr. Pinochet's Chile. In the past four months alone, at least 90 activists, teachers, journalists, and lawyers have disappeared or been murdered in Baluchistan, according to Amnesty International, and I suspect that's in reality a very low number. Second, because it is strategically located near the Arabian Ocean, Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz, a vital artery for U.S. oil supplies. An independent Baluchistan would not be a threat to U.S. interests because Baluch leaders have often declared their support for U.S. strategic objectives in the Persian Gulf and have offered assurances repeatedly that the U.S. Navy and U.S. merchant shipping would have access to the modernized port facilities now being built at Gwadar with Chinese help. I suppose it's more or less completed, but uh, there's still uh, work going on. It's, it's critical to U.S. <coughs> interests to maintain ties with the Baluch that deny control of Gwadar to China. Third, since the Baluch practice the Zikri variant of Islam, the Baluchistan is a bastion against the spread of Islamist forces now dominating the rest of Pakistan. Notwithstanding Islamabad's efforts to depict them as terrorists, Baluch nationalist groups have avoided ties with Islamist forces in Pakistan and Afghanistan and have cooperated with secular Pashtun elements in areas of northern Baluchistan where there are Pashtun enclaves. Fourth, because it is a treasure trove of natural resources, especially oil, gas, and copper. Baluchistan never wanted to be a part of Pakistan. Never wanted to be a part of Pakistan. It was nominally incorporated into it only after bloody struggles with the Pakistan army, which I go into in some detail in my book, uh, in Afghanistan's shadow, Baluch nationalism and Soviet temptations. Now the army maintains control by suppressing the Baluch independent movement with ruthless persecution of Baluch activists. I feel strongly that a working relationship between the Baluch and the Pakistan central government would have been desirable, would have been. And I strongly advocated measures to promote this objective in my book Pakistan, a state of the union. That was the product of a study group that Marvin fortunately participated in. But the weakness of the Zardari government in promoting greater autonomy for Baluch <coughs> and in preventing the ISI from persecuting Baluch leaders, as it consistently does, ruthlessly does, leading to the human rights violations I discussed, have made the emergence of an independent Baluchistan increasingly likely. Significantly, Baluch leaders have assured India and Iran that they would cooperate in the construction and operation of a projected Iran-India gas pipeline that would traverse Baluchistan. 
India would become an independent, would welcome an independent Baluchistan. And I believe has given some covert help to Baluch groups with money and possibly with arms. Pakistan makes uh, consistent charges to this effect, but when you ask uh, ISI friends to give you evidence, they say, come to Islamabad for a briefing. I can't give it to you here in Washington. <laughs> the United States, in my view, has nothing to fear from an independent Baluchistan. Indeed, an independent Baluchistan would reinforce a U.S. South Asia policy oriented to India as a rising regional and global power and would give the U.S. new leverage over Iran in protecting the U.S. interest and the uninhibited passage of ships through the Strait of Hormuz. Those are our prepared remarks. I might add one point that I think is terribly important, and that is that the Baluch Nationalist Movement, when I wrote about it in my book, was tribally based, was narrowly based, uh, but now we have a nationalist movement that uh, is built around a politically conscious, educated youth and political activists in the towns and uh, urban centers that have developed in Bhutan. So I do believe it's a formidable force, as I have said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for, for those comments. Um, since uh, Mr. Harrison has to leave, unfortunately, we won't have him for, for questions at the end. But I wanted to ask the panelists if any of you have any questions or comments on the remarks before we, we get to the next presentation. Does anybody? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, this would, of course, require uh, another entire sitting. But I just want to say one thing that. Uh, if anyone in Washington actually takes this view seriously, or this analysis, then I think Washington is in deep trouble vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, not just on the basis of the various fault lines that are already developing, but this one is going to be the last nail in the coffin of this US-Pakistan strategic partnership or whatever, tactical partnership or whatever it is. Uh, and I don't think mercifully that anyone would take this view seriously. Uh, and uh, the thing about human rights abuses, worse since the time of Pinochet, uh, no word about what the Baloch sub-nationalists have done to the settlers in Balochistan. Uh, and also, uh, I also read uh, Mr. Harrison's uh, article, uh, Free Balochistan, uh, in this publication called The National Interest, if you will that indeed is the U.S. national interest, uh, that there are six million Baloch insurgents. I think uh, that is a highly exaggerated group. Six million Baloch? Uh, <laughs> there is, not all insurgents. Yeah, well, your article says six million Baloch insurgents. I have it open here. If you okay. Want to um, is, there, is there any other question here, Marvin, Shazadi, anything? For, okay. like Sir, to, could you, yeah, would you? I'd like a quick comment. Before he leaves, I would like to ask uh, him Please, to please, uh, let's, let's, let's. Unfortunately, the U.S. government does not take this view seriously. The U.S. government, as we all know, is in bed with uh, Generals Kayani and Pasha, trying to kick a little bit into bed the last few days, but I mean, you know, uh, uh, no, this is, this is the problem. Uh, the U.S. government has put some people in the uh, Karachi Council to watch this, pay attention to it. But uh, I, I certainly, my whole problem is that the US is in bed with a government that is promoting Islamist forces that are a threat to India and that are a threat to the United States. Lashkar e Taiba talks about the same sort of thing that Times Square Bonner did. So there's far from a problem with the US government taking my, my view. Okay. Uh, Shalom? Just very quickly, I mean, if the US is in bed with um, General Pasha and uh, General Kiani, then it's a very bad uh, relationship that they have. They should be much more harmonious if they're in bed together. The relationship between the US and Pakistan has actually never been so bad. The whole position with Balochistan, and one of the, the key issues that I want to raise, is that to actually support a movement for separatism is a very, very dangerous uh, avenue to travel down in that region. It's dangerous in any region, but particularly dangerous in that region. One of the issues that um, Mr. Harrison hasn't raised 
but I know that it is in his uh, report called State of the Union, um, is the whole situation with Iran. Give them a free hand, why don't you? I mean, there is, there is actually a great deal to be said on that. I mean, I'm not going to raise it all now because I want to talk about that in, in just a moment. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, I have a medical appointment, as I explained to you. Yes, that's yes. why I yes. wanted to have a meeting at 10, and I, I failed. But uh, so for, this, for that reason, I had said from the beginning that I would have to run off. But I enjoyed this very much. And I thank you very much. I hope we'll get a lot of good discussion going. Thank you for coming. Um, I, I actually have it here and we'll pass it out. What? We'll pass the map out. Yeah, we just prepared a map that I think is very helpful in seeing the ethnic division. Did you make any map of Azad Kishti? Uh, excuse me, can, can we please move on? I, I don't think we need thank the floor at this point. I forgot thank to mention, you thank you, thank you so much, sir. I forgot to mention that we are webcasting this event live. So for the speakers, please speak as close to the mic as possible. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me move then quickly to uh, Ms. Baig uh, to, to give her remarks. I guess this is on. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to speak from here. Um, being a lawyer, I'm much more comfortable on my feet than sitting down. Now, there are those who say, and we've just heard one opinion about that, that the Belot insurgency, with its deep-seated grievances and history of rebellion, will eventually succeed in establishing an independent Balochistan. Well, I'm firmly of the view that that really is not the case if you look at um, the whole area and what's happening on the ground. The fact of the matter is that we're talking about a territory, Balochistan, which comprises of 43% of Pakistani land territory. You have army and air force garrisons located in a number of locations, including Kolu, Gwada, Sui, Dera Bukti, Sibi, and in other areas. You have 12 Corps, which is present in Quetta under Southern Command. And when, on my visit last year, I actually spent some time out um, talking to the army at uh, Southern Command. Two divisions, 33 and 41, in protective deployment across the province. Then you have the Frontier Corps, a paramilitary force which has units across Balochistan. The traditional institution of the levies, um, has been, which was replaced, in fact, under Musharraf, he did a, a plan, I believe, from um, 2003 to 2008, in which he took away the power of the levies um, at a cost, a staggering cost, of 10 million rupees and gave full powers to the police. This was important, and this remains the key focus of what I want to talk about, which is the law and order situation. In 2009, uh, the present government brought back the levies in a highly retrograde step, in my view, uh, and did away with the police system. This has, of course, contributed in eroding further um, uh, writ of the state. The archaic system of the levies was meant for simple societies. It was not meant for a complex modern structure of a modern state. The civil bureaucracy is also aware that there are huge opportunities for corruption. The conversion of what became known as A areas, A areas equals police, B areas equals levies, is a tragedy in my view for all of those who want to see the rule of law strengthened in this province, um, which as I say, comprises of almost half of Pakistan. To have no police in 95% of Balochistan means that there is a vast safe haven for Al-Qaeda and the Taliban to operate. They probably can't believe the gift that's been handed to them by a civilian democratic government. The whole issue of the rule of law is, of course, being closely watched by the Chinese, who have invested quite considerably in Gwada port and have a stake in its future including protecting Beijing's oil supply lines from the Middle East and to counter the US presence in South and Central Asia. Balochistan is also a potential transit route for the Iran-Turkmenistan-India pipeline. It has a wide range of natural resources, underdeveloped oil reserves, uranium and gold deposits, and it has significant gas reserves. Then, of course, there is Balochistan's strategic location. It commands 900 miles of the Arabian Sea coastline, close to the Persian Gulf and the Straits of Hormuz, which, as we've heard from Mr. Harrison, vital for US oil 
supply. Balochi leaders have sought U.S. support for separatism. They have consistently offered um, future port facilities of Gwadar to the U.S. Navy. Balochi grievances can be summed up in four major areas, and I'll just talk very quickly about those. Natural resources, Balochistan has failed to benefit from gas deposits. There are tensions in relation to that issue. It's, it's historical, it's been ongoing. The Balochi say that you know 30% of Pakistan's gas comes from this area, but we only consume 17% of it, and we don't get our fair share of the royalties. One very important um, issue that I ought to flag up on the horizon is Reko Dik. I don't know how many of you have been following that. Reko Dik is an area um, in which uh, there are considerable um, deposits of um, uh, gold and copper that have been found. The, several experts from Washington, actually, who went to Pakistan, gave um, an opinion about that and said that if these are properly mined, then this area could be richer than some of the Gulf states because the deposits are so huge. What happened with the, the Reko Dik um, uh, issue is that a contract worth 260 um, billion US dollars was awarded to a Canadian Chilean conglomerate. Um, at a deal which, if I perhaps put it in, in very um, well-mannered language, not at arm's length, um, there was huge kickbacks that were paid back and there was prima facie evidence that um, all was not well, as it should be. That matter um, has now gone to the Supreme Court because there were allegations made um, by the provincial government. It's now sub judice and there is a, a judgment due on that. Secondly, marginalization. The Balochis have had only a minor role in the construction of the Guada port. The project has remained largely under central government and some of the complaints from the Balochis is that they have found it difficult to obtain work on development projects. The government um, in Balochistan hasn't invested in schools or colleges, and land has been sold um, at giveaway you know, prices below market value. Literacy level is very low amongst um, most of the ethnic groups, including the Baloch and the Pashtun. Thirdly, Baloch nationalism, and this is, of course, the, the big issue there. The resurgence, um, as some describe it, has uh, arisen not only because of Baloch grievances, but because there is considerable international support to the insurgency. The two Baloch tribes, Mengal and Mari, have a history of tribal revolt and um, political debate on the rights of the Baloch people. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into all of that because I think the Dijazi is going to cover some of those, those issues relating to that. Successive governments have attempted to purchase tribal leaders to control a particular area under a particular Sadar. The Sadars themselves have ensured that the areas remain underdeveloped. And believe you me, some of the, the Sadars I met, there was a guy who, you know, he said it sort of almost as a joke, a tongue in cheek. He said, well, you know, you see these um, peasants. He said, we, we use them as target practice. That may, may have been said as a joke or maybe tongue in cheek, but the reality remains that that is uh, part of the, the thinking. Even those individuals who had you know, contracts working for, say, Sui Gas, were often actually paid in cash by the Sadars, and the, and the money, this is your wages, were on the, was on the floor by the feet of the Sadar, so that you had to grovel effectively to pick it up. Challenging the authorities of the Sadars has been unthinkable by the locals for a very long time. Akbar Bukti, the man who was um, killed, had up to 2,000 men at different times. Some of them were levies, some of them were his own men, and many of them were paid through the cash that had been given to the Sadars. Uneducated, jobless, politically divided, frustrated people have persistently been exploited in the country and certainly from outside. Since the death of Akbar Bukhti, some of the Balochi leaders have attempted to loosely sort of come together to deal with wider Balochi interests. A word about Afghan refugees. Volatile community, um, some of them have been accused, and I, and I don't know really where the truth of this lies, but some of them have been accused of harboring um, insurgents. Um, some of them have been accused of being involved in targeted uh, killings. Most have never known stability, and there continues to be um, an uncertain environment, uncertain future for them. Some of the, the teenage boys have been known to loot um, 
NATO supply trucks. NATO supply trucks that I saw when I went to the, um, the Kandahar Chaman border, you stand at the border, and, and this is interesting actually because at the border you have very good security on the, on the Pakistan side and you know, there's a channel for people who are walking and a channel for, for different types of vehicles. But as far as the eye can see, there are NATO supply trucks that travel through, they stay there, there are arms being shipped through, there's you know, all kinds of supplies that are being shipped through. And um, there is a, an issue that I wanted to, to really flag up, which perhaps I can flag up now. I saw something very interesting. I, mean, I, I came to Washington, actually, not just to speak on this, but to speak at another event on um, AFPAC soft power, which the State Department was organizing. And um, David Kilcullen was there, and he talked about you know, one of the big issues in Afghanistan being corruption. What absolutely astonished me was that when I was at the border, some of the trucks that go through um, seem to have arms that are then distributed in Afghanistan. And there was a guy by the name of um, General Rizak, who I'd never heard of. And I asked some of the people there, I said, you know, who is this man? Is he a military man? Who does he work for? And the response that I got was that actually he was a nobody. I mean, I think he was a vegetable seller when life started out for him. But then life got considerably better because he went over the border. He established something called the Baloch Colony, where he started training Balochis to carry out insurgent activities over the border in Balochistan. And they blow up gas pipelines. Now, this man is now so wealthy that he's got houses in Dubai and all over the place. And he is supported by the Americans. He's supported by the Indians. And what he does, and, 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 the, and he's been photographed. I mean, there are, there are you know, satellite photographs of him handing out weapons. And I was surprised that this man is allowed to operate. What, the way in which he's made a lot of his money is that every vehicle that goes over the border has to pay a diesel tax. You either pay in petrol or you pay in cash, but pay you must. And then you get a stamped receipt and that receipt is taken. Black economy, massive corruption supported by the US. Now, I was alarmed about that. When I came back to London, um, I went to a briefing by RC South, as it happened. So I raised this and I said, you know, is this true? Or, you know, is, is this sort of propaganda? What, what is this? And, and I was told that, yes, this is absolutely true. And yes, we do pay a diesel, diesel tax. And yes, the man is very wealthy. And we are well aware that he has weapons. But, we, but, but he's, he's our man. You know, he's anti-Taliban and therefore he must be okay, was a response I got. Extremely dangerous uh, situation. The other matter that I want to raise up um, is, and I'll talk very briefly about this, um, uh, disappeared persons. It's a matter that constantly seems to be attached to, particularly to Balochistan. Um, the press has been reporting that, you know, there have been scores of bodies riddled with bullets that have been found in Balochistan and that other people have simply disappeared. Um, provincial government set up a cell for the investigation and recovery of missing persons. I'm not really sure what's happened with that. But what I can tell you is that um, on one of my visits to, to Pakistan, the Supreme Court, which has for a long time um, taken up these issues, took up the issue of missing persons and asked the head of the Federal Investigation Agency, which is the equivalent to your FBI. It's, it's a big position. And the Chief Justice said to the Director General, you will be here nine o'clock tomorrow morning with this man, because if this man who disappeared four years ago is not produced, you will go to jail. And the following morning, um, nine o'clock in the morning, the man was produced. And the, the cameras were all there and the press were there and they stuck a microphone on him and they said, where have you been? And he said, well, I was picked up from Punjab about four years ago um, on suspicion of being involved with terrorist groups. I wasn't involved with them. And they took me to Balochistan and I sat in a room and I had three meals a day for four years. And he came out and the, the whole thing was very bizarre. But I mean, I only flag this up because it is an important issue. It's a very emotive issue. And there are lots of cases pending currently in the Supreme Court on this. Right, I'll move very quickly. Um, I hope I'm all right for time. I'll move very quickly to um, position with India, important. The state of Pakistan has, of course, been aware for a very long time that Baloch nationalists, including the BLA, have been trained and funded by foreigners, including India. Successive chief ministers, including Jan Muhammad Yusuf, um, who was uh, prime minister in 2004, um, is on record as saying that the Indian Secret Service have maintains and has maintained for some time uh, scores of terrorist training camps in Balochistan. 
Pakistan's um, last foreign minister, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, um, told his counterpart that, um, that the Indian passport that Bram, Bramdag Bukti, who was the grandson of Bukti, he, he holds an Indian passport, that that should be cancelled. Since India opened its consulates in Afghanistan, it has been persistently accused of um, sponsoring insurgent activity in Balochistan. India is also seen as considering China's role in the construction of Gwadar port as a potential threat to its economic and strategic interests in the region. Balochistan may yet become a bigger obstacle in Pakistan-India um, relations than even Kashmir. There, then there are other international players, amongst them uh, the British, the Americans, the Iranians, and the Afghans. It should be, in this audience, a no-brainer that any external support to dissident groups will not only further destabilize the region, but will actually provide a greater handle to Iran in regional affairs. Make no mistake about that. Iran remains concerned about acts of terrorism on its border. Uh, I'm going to miss a big chunk that I wanted to talk about because time is short. It's safe to say that they have had terrorist attacks, which they have blamed on Jandola, which is a, a group um, that um, has been uh, based periodically, or at least functioning out of uh, parts of Balochistan. Um, what about the US? Washington and its allies must be aware that they, well, they are aware that they could um, flame what is already a very grave situation um, that we, we now have. They are aware that Baloch nationalists who oppose the Taliban uh, can be used to exert pressure both on the Taliban and Iran. There is, of course, very little love loss between the mullahs and the sadars, and the Baloch have sought to exploit the situation prevailing in Waziristan. Insurgents, and, and this was again part of my uh, fact-finding uh, mission, from the tribal belt have been known to cross into the mountains of Balochistan and melt into some of the Pakhtun population in Quetta and in Chaman. What is clear is that there has been a free flow of arms in Balochistan for a very long time. Two years ago, some of the Balochi leaders were recognizing that without foreign support, they could not prevail over a strong military, and a determined central government made it known that they would be satisfied with a generous version of autonomy. The government then announced at the end of 2009, and if anybody wants any more about this, I can talk about this later, um, the Baluch constitutional uh, package, um, but much of that has yet um, been implemented. Um, so far as Afghanistan is concerned, has a long border with um, Balochistan, and um, the terrain, I mean, th th this, is, this is quite important because the, the terrain, of course, is um, so difficult that you know, some of the areas can't even be negotiated with, with donkeys. But the fact remains that there are people that crisscross the border uh, between Pakistan and Afghanistan. The fact also remains that in Afghanistan, you have a sizable Baloch population in places like Nimroz, Helmand, and even Farah. OK, one minute left. In conclusion, I say this, that with the end state negotiations in the pipeline as the US um, drawdown begins in Afghanistan, Groundwork, in my view, must be laid for effective dialogue with insurgent leaders in Balochistan and civil society leaders. There must be serious efforts at capacity building in the law enforcement and justice system. And Pakistan needs help with its, uh, to restructure its governance structures. The international community, and this is really the, the kind of key message, if you like, um, is that it needs to understand very clearly the correlation between an ineffective criminal justice system and the root causes of many of Balochistan's problems. For there to be sustainable peace in Afghanistan, there must be stability and the rule of law in Balochistan. And it will take, in my view, leaders with vision to promote a conducive environment for building a lasting peace, and it must be lasting and sustainable to all its neighbors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shazali, for that elaborate uh, presentation. Um, clearly, your, your ground experience uh, comes out very, uh, very well in, in that. Uh, may I now turn to Ijaz with uh, the caveat that uh, we are slightly behind time. So 15 minutes and no more, please. Thank you, Moeen. Uh, it's always difficult to figure out where to start from when it comes to Balochistan, it's become even more difficult after this very articulate presentation. But let me just uh, 
flag one point before we get into uh, details, that the irony of the current situation in Balochistan is that this uh, Baloch unrest began somewhat early 2006, not because the federal government was trying to deprive Balochistan of something, but because the federal government I realized that it was in Pakistan's strategic interest to develop Balochistan. This is one of the ironies that needs to be flagged. Out of which was born this Baloch sentiment that Gawadar and Pasmi and Jivani and these ports and the cantonments and the building of the roads and our developing other infrastructure was once again an attempt by the central government quote unquote, to colonize Balochistan. So this uh, fact needs to be planned. Now, there are, in terms of the population, there are essentially three broad groups. You've got the Baloch, and then you've got the Barawis. And this is an interesting thing that the biggest tribe in Balochistan, uh, which is the non pashtun or the non sectarian tribe, are the Mangals. And the Mangals are Barawis, they're not Baloch. Although, for the purposes of this Baloch movement, the Brahmis, the Mangals, consider themselves Baloch. Um, Mr. Harrison had talked about 6 million Baloch. It's a very interesting thing that uh, there has been this consideration of holding a census in Balochistan to exactly figure out what the population ratios are. And the one broad group that opposes that census are the Baloch. So then you have the Pashtun, and then you have the settlers, which are generally Punjabi and Hazaras. And Hazaras uh, is a small community, mostly uh, based uh, in Quetta, and also uh, south of Quetta, in Masnou. And these are primarily Shia, and they, they, had, they came from the Hadarajats and they also came from parts of Afghanistan and settled there. They are uh, among the the other ethnic groups, they are the most educated, literate group, socially upwardly mobile, generally join the army, the police, civil services, uh, doctors, engineers, so they're, they're broadly speaking the most educated groups. So these are the the, the ethnicities. And the fault lines, broadly speaking, one fault line is the Baloch sub-nationalism. I want to flag this point that I do not describe this as Baloch nationalism. There are sub-nationalist groups. And the reason I say that is that, and this, this is something that I firmly believe in, that the Baloch problem has to be dealt with politically through dialogue and unconditional dialogue. But that dialogue has to be conducted within the federal framework of Pakistan. The United States fought its war of independence on the principle of segregation. And then the North fought the South on the principle of integration. So when states are there, they do not allow parts to secede. And the Pakistani state is no peculiar exception to this general principle. So whatever needs to be done in Balochistan, and it must be done, and urgently, has to be done within the federal framework through an unconditional dialogue uh, with all groups that want to participate uh, in, in that uh, dialogue. The other fault line is the sectarian fault line. And this is generally in Quetta and in Mustok. And the target of this are the Hazaras, who are Shia. And they're targeted by the Lashkar Changi, which is a violent offshoot of Sibai Saba, Pakistan. But interestingly enough, most of its cadres in Balochistan are Baloch. And generally the Kurds, which uh, are based in Mastok. And an interesting fact about that is that in Mastok, there is a lot of Iranian money that comes in. And another uh, tribe, the Donkeys, have generally begun to convert to Shia. So donkeys have been attacked, and the Hazaras have been attacked uh, in, in uh, Quetta. As a matter of fact, in terms of uh, the number of violent deaths, 
this particular fault line has claimed more people than any other fault line. Then we have the Afghan Taliban. The Afghan Taliban, of course, come and go, and <coughs> ironically, are the most peaceful group as far as the Pakistani state is concerned because there is no particular law and order or any other problem uh, emanating from these people. As to why they should be able to come in and go back, I was in Chaman uh, about two months ago and I stood there and talked to the Afghan border guards and they showed me the ID cards, they had Pakistani national ID cards. Two of them had been uh, doing small businesses in Quetta before they joined the Afghan border security force. I actually convinced them uh, to let me go in. I had no permit, no passport, no visa. So I went to Wish Mandi, I went to spend more the I moved around, came back, talked to people who were moving back and forth, met with this Pakistani guy from Chaman who has his shop in uh, Wish Mandi for the last 30 years. Uh, when we placed the biometric system there uh, on the German crossing, it was attacked by the Afghans at the behest of the Afghan government who destroyed the biometric system. So this border is not a border that you can automatically see against people's coming and going across. Then you have Jandula. And Jandula, as the Iranians said to me, and they're convinced of this, and there is some evidence that if the Pakistani state's state looks the other way, while the Americans and the Saudis fund Jandullah. But the, the trouble is, Jandullah is linking up with Lashkar Jangbi, and some of the recent suicide bombings inside Sistan, Bolochistan have been carried out by the LJ activists. So, Jandullah, which is fighting the Shia state, for the independence of Sistan, Balochistan, is Sunni, links up with LJ, which is Sunni, and LJ provides support to them also, and LJ is killing uh, the Hazaras in Quetta also. And then, of course, you've got the external actors. Uh, some of the actors uh, this big mentioned. Let me also add that the Gulf states are also interested in destabilizing this particular part and which is why the trouble has kind of moved south and southwest from the heart of the Mari, Bukhti, Bengal uh, areas and Um uh, We have, uh, uh, as the Baloch sub-nationalist groups go, we've got the, uh, the BLA, uh, which is uh, led by, uh, which is the Mari, uh, which is the Mari uh, based group led by Abhya Mari Yusuf Sanat. And then we got the BRA, which is Bukhti based, led by Ramda. Ramda, Mir Ali Bukhti, and Shahzad Bukhti, three grandsons of Nawab Akbar Bukhti, uh, are at Dagos Rock with each other. Mir Ali Bukhti has recently been thrown out of their Bukhti. Shahzad has been trying to get in and reclaim the Bukhti throne. Ramda Bukhti obviously considers that he is the man who has to uh, lead uh, the Bukhti uh, clan. So there is this, these fault lines, intra-Bukhti fault lines. Um, as far as Dera Bukhti, uh, this particular Bukhti area is concerned, Nawab Akbar Bukhti at various times was the interior minister of Pakistan, the governor of Balochistan, and chief minister of Balochistan. Took a lot of money uh, from OGDC uh, and the government of Pakistan as a kind of rent for the Sui fields and the other mineral borders that there are in Dera Bukti. But according to the Human Development Index, Dera Bukti is the worst district in Pakistan in terms of Asia. So the point that Ms. Baig was making about the Sadars. Uh, actually not allowing the areas to develop. And this is where the problem lay. And we, we got it as a legacy of the British Raj, because when Pakistan was formed, 
what all they did was, and this is what successive governments kept doing, both civilian and military, that you go to the bazaar, you find the biggest tent, you make a deal with the guy who sits in the tent, and let him deal with the rest of the bazaar. And that's what, what was happening constantly, and it was one sardar, if someone, uh, someone else is giving trouble, so you give money to one, and so on and so forth. And that kind of created uh, this, this system where the federal government never had a real outreach to the people of Balochistan. Uh, people of Balochistan, i.e. the Baloch. Because let's not forget that there is a Baloch problem. Uh, because Balochistan is not just Baloch. The, the, as I said, the, the, the big major, you know, population of the Pashtun. Uh, which has absolutely no issue with the Federation, uh, so to speak. And the Hazaras, of course, completely uh, uh, embedded in the administrative system. And most of them uh, actually uh, have uh, a stake in within the federal and the provincial system. Currently, there is a provincial government. There is a National Finance Commission award which had been hanging fire for 17 years, and which was worked out among the four federating units, primarily on the basis of the formula that Balochistan wanted. And it, it has been flagged as a major achievement of the current government. So that is very important. There's also a rights of Balochistan package, which has 29 points in it. Some of that has started happening. A lot of it still needs to happen, especially the disbursement of the monies that elevated to Balochistan. As far as the, the Baloch youth is concerned, in combination with the Balochistan government, the army began a project uh, for educating Baloch youth. It focuses exclusively on the Baloch. So they, uh, there's a system through which they uh, select uh, boys and girls, 50% boys, 50% girls, which are placed in various private and public schools across Pakistan. And the tuition fees and you know board and lodge and movement and everything is paid for to a fund, uh, which is to which the Balochistan government also contributes. Similarly, uh, Purely on the on the army side, the army has started a program recruiting uh, the Baloch into the army, and they have uh, up until now recruited about ten thousand uh, troops, which are exclusively Baloch from the Baloch areas. They have for the officer guard, they have actually brought down some of those benchmarks required for uh, entry into the Pakistan military academy. So. This is what the army is trying to do, to pull the Baloch in and to give them a sense of ownership uh, and uh, for them to be part of the, the tradition. Rekodek and Sendak and the Kasa Marble Minefield and all that uh, is being just talked about. But let me uh, tell you something very interesting. And and this was this this came as a uh, as a strange surprise to me also. The Baloch always invokes the hidden wealth, but the Baloch will never become a miner. He will never go into the inner reaches of all the mining is carried out by Pashtun from Deer and Swat. The Baloch outside of the mine are prepared to provide security and to be and to you know have these small businesses with the infrastructure like stalls and the rest of it, but not even on pain of death is he going to enter a mine. Don't ask me why, but when I ask these people, uh, so very really racist comment. Sir, sir, can we, can we, can we please? Very racist. No, comment. can we please finish before before we have any questions? Uh, Go ahead. Uh, you I'm just stating something. Mr. Heather, can you please continue yeah, with yeah. your with your presentation, yeah. sir? Please. So yeah. when I went to the Jamalang uh, coal mines. I actually, because I was meeting with the with the Maris and the Lunis, and I was also uh, talking to the other Baloch, and I asked them. I said, uh, 
is there any baloch that actually goes into the minefield? And they said, no. We will provide security, but this is not something that we are prepared to do. Because for some reason, they, it's, it's, it's like, for instance, I will not go into a mine. I am not a baloch, I am not a Pashtun, I will not go into a mine. Uh, it, it's maybe because I feel claustrophobic. Maybe I have some some fear that I don't want to go into the inner regions of the earth. So the miners are all Pashtun, and that is that is something that I found very strange. Uh, so in any case, as far as uh, the mining part of it is concerned, you are unlikely to get Baloch to go into the mine. So you'll have to have people uh, mostly from. Uh, to come and manage these, these mines. Uh, finally, because uh, it's just two, two minutes left, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a problem that needs to be dealt with, as I said politically. A dialogue needs to start. The, those points in the rights of the Lotusan package that uh, have not been uh, dealt with as yet need to be dealt with. Uh, something needs to be done very, very quickly about human rights abuses that are being alleged and for which there is some evidence also. Although I must say that there are strange narratives on all sides of the, the board line and we can discuss those uh, when the floor is open to questions. Uh, but there is no insurgency going on in Pakistan. There's trouble, but no insurgency. We have a thriving insurgency already in the federally administered tribal areas. And I think, given that, uh, we don't need to have another insurgency in another province. But yes, there is a little bit of, of last year and a little bit of, of last there, but no sustained insurgency in the in the Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marvin, if I could directly move to you. Yes. Uh, yes. You, uh, sorry, you really do have a tough challenge because yeah. if I may say so, I haven't absorbed this much in, this much information. Well, that's that's, in that's exactly where I wanted to start because uh, we've had such a detailed portrait here that <laughs> I certainly couldn't add to to what we've heard. But what I can, I hope, talk about is a little bit about the American perspective on this. And um, whether we're going to call it a Baluch insurgency or struggle, uh, I'll leave that up to others. It is a challenge, nevertheless, to the Pakistan state. And, uh, but that it's read differently in, in the U.S. Uh, for many Pakistanis, so the Baluch nationalists are, are terrorists, uh, uh, <clears throat> militant, militant nationalists, uh, terrorists. But, as we view it in the United States, for the most part, this is a domestic issue. Uh, uh, to some extent, it gets attention here because there are human rights issues which arise, particularly with the uh, identification of targeted killings and the disappearance of uh, Baluch nationalists, which has become uh, quite quite a uh, an issue. Uh, recently, uh, mutilated bodies. Of Abducted militants, presumably. Uh, there's also a lack of concern about the uh, the struggle, if you will, uh, because uh, we view this uh, essentially as a as a secular movement. Uh, there's no evidence uh, that I'm aware of that these ethnically Baluch fighters have aligned with international terrorists or particularly the Pashtun uh, Pakistani Taliban. Now, having said that, uh, if, it's, if it's not the insurgency, uh, just the same, we have a strategic, important strategic interest, I believe, uh, in Baluchistan. Uh, and of course, that relates mainly at the moment because we have a war going on in Afghanistan, and it's from this province that at least a good number of the and Afghan insurgents are launched, particularly those going into the southern provinces. This is the, where the main line uh, of, the, of the forces challenging the U.S., as I say, are inf infiltrating. Uh, 
And whether Mullah Omar is there or he's somewhere in Karachi, which many believe, nevertheless, it remains an important command center. Uh, uh, very probably, Al-Qaeda has a presence in northern Baluchistan, although we generally tend to see it uh, as having its base in north Waziristan. Uh, it, it's long been the site, of course, ever since the Taliban left Afghanistan or pushed out of Afghanistan in 01, uh, it's been the source uh, of uh, presence, which we call the Quetta Shura. Uh, and we know for many years that its leaders could move around freely in the city. They were under, and they remain under the protection, if not fully the control, of Pakistan's ISI. In any event, uh, many of us look at this as the neglected front in the encounter insurgency. Uh, now, the U.S. continues with drone attacks, uh, and um, uh, we often note the fact that, despite of what I've just said, uh, the Baluch targets are entirely excluded. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has not had approval for these strikes from the government of Pakistan. Uh, in any case, it would be much more difficult to employ uh, the drones, if, especially if we think that the command centers are located in urban Quetta. Now, there has been some level of cooperation with Pakistan's security forces, uh, joint operations with the ISI. We know about this. Uh, I guess the Mullah uh, Bar Barada uh, incident uh, demonstrates this. It also demonstrates a good many other things, which we won't go into now. But uh, the ISI uh, at times does put clamps on the Quetta Shura, just to remind them who's in control. Uh, the leaders' families residing as they are in Pakistan gives, Pakistan gives the ISI considerable leverage. But in the end, uh, I don't believe, and I don't think they believe, that they can dictate to the Afghan Taliban. Now, the U.S. gets implicated in, in this because uh, we're seen here as, in our actions in Afghanistan, as providing the cover, the creating the conditions un, under which uh, India is able to meddle in, uh, in uh, Pakistan, and particularly in the Balochistan uh, struggle. Uh, uh, that, uh, now, there are many of us who think that India's interest here is essentially an interest uh, because of the emergence of regional terrorism. But of course, Pakistan still believes that this is part of some larger geostrategic uh, problem that they have. Uh, uh, it's interesting, of course, given the history of, of India's involvement there in the 1970s and, uh, and at other times, uh, you could understand some of Pakistan's uh, obsession with this. Uh, but the level of Indian assistance with money and perhaps weapons is, is to my mind, very unclear. Uh, it, too often, it, it smacks of the same kind of conspiracy theories that one hears when relating to our, the supposed Indian involvement, and American for that matter, with the TTP. Uh, uh, now, maybe these are separate. Maybe in one case it is conspiracy theory and fantasy, and maybe in the other case it's real. But the fact is that uh, it's interesting that Pakistan has never come out with hard evidence of Indian involvement. Now, that doesn't mean it's not taking place, but it's always struck me the fact that uh, whereas India, of course, was anxious to build a case in Mumbai, uh, Pakistan has not at all. Now, there may be reasons that you can share with me why that's the case. I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, now, we have a great deal of interest here also because our supply routes to Afghanistan, uh, uh, at least one of them, major one, the one that goes through, uh, through Chaman, uh, passes through Baluchistan. Uh, now, there's another interest, too, because going the other way is the route for drugs. Uh, and uh, as we concerned about drug trafficking in Afghanistan, that means the flow into Baluchistan uh, of, of a good portion of the drugs that's leaving Afghanistan. Afghanistan, uh, we've heard already about Gwadar Port, and here, of course, the concern here is that there's a, 
a, a possibility of a future Chinese presence. Uh, we've heard about it being major shipping lanes, makes it important. Uh, we do know that China has an economic stake now in, 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 in Pakistan, which goes beyond <clears throat> its strategic, uh, uh, geostrategic calculations. Baluchistan comes into play, and we've also heard this, because of the Jandula fighters operation and their operations in, in Iran. Uh, whether there's some level of U.S. involvement in this is alleged is, is again, still to be demonstrated. Uh, it certainly fits our, 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 our scheme of things, perhaps. <laughs> um, what, um, but it, it, it is important for Pakistan, certainly, because it affects its relations with, uh, with them. Now, I want to return, before I finish here, to the Baluch uprising uh, that began, I guess, in 03 or so. Um, uh, the U.S., I think, has an interest in Islamabad succeeding in dealing with the Baluch separatists, in spite of the fact that I say that this is marginal for us. As nationalists, they have uh, uh, they do have an intense antipathy toward the state, especially the Punjabis who they accuse of looting uh, their resources and repressing them. It's, I believe, and I don't agree with Selleck Harrison here, uh, I believe it's not, it's not in our interest to see Pakistan fragment in any way, uh, uh, along, certainly along ethnic and provincial lines. Uh, which would make it even less a, a strategic partner. The U.S. Uh, uh, interest in Pakistan government resolving its dis differences with the nationalists, I think, is, is to see that come about in a peaceful and, I stress, equitable fashion. Uh, and that's unlikely to happen, I think we agree, without an investment in the province's development and a greater, uh, being greater attuned to questions of equity and perhaps the the devolution process, which is underway in Pakistan here, can make uh, some uh, progress in that development. Uh, I'd like to include on a positive note, uh, I guess I don't have to fully, because we were concerned we might, we might uh, have, uh, no, no, uh, yeah, uh, that uh, we've heard about the mineral wealth, the Sui reserves here, uh, the m possibly major mineral uh, reserves. Um, this is an ideal port, Gwadar, for international trade going into Central Asia, uh, gas and oil pipelines that, that uh, are going to have to cross Baluchistan, whether they're coming from Afghanistan or they're coming from Iran, they're going to have to cross uh, Baluchistan. And that means that if there is going to be that, that development, which could have such an important role in, in bringing these countries in the area, uh, uh, to bringing them together in terms of their uh, convergent interests, uh, should it happen, and I wouldn't invest in it at this moment because I, I, uh, I think the finances on it are still very questionable. But nevertheless, uh, the transshipment from either place is going to require a more secure environment in Baluchistan. Uh, I think it's important that we see that the, this secure environment is not going to happen through a, achieved through a military solution. Uh, I think that's very clear. So the question, I leave you with the idea that, uh, that uh, Baluchistan's future is in Pakistan. And Pakistan's future, I think to a large extent here, particularly in terms of its uh, economic potential lies in Baluchistan. The question is uh, whether either side is going to realize that potential. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks once again, Marvin. Always informative and eloquent. Uh, I'm going to give one minute each and no more to the three panelists if they want to respond to anything anybody else has said, if there is anything. But one minute, because then we want to ask if there are other questions. I just want to uh, comment on um a couple of things that uh, Marvin, uh, that you said. One was that about India's involvement. You said this is still in the um, fairyland of conspiracy theories. I, I mean, said there was no evidence. Well, I, I said I, I wanted to see if you have hard evidence. I said yeah. without that, it falls into the conspiracy. But Sorry. you know, Marvin, you know that this, you know, that this has, in recent years, 
in very recent times been commented on, for example, by General McChrystal. I was there when he made that comment at a, um, a session in London. I'm not allowed to attribute comments to the conference that you and I were at just two days ago, where there was acceptance by people who have held official positions in the US that yes, there has been support, funding, arming, training by India to the Lord insurgents. So that, you know, that is there. I'm not sure that it's very helpful to then go back and say, well, you know, th there is still no hard evidence. Um, th the second matter is that, um, yes, actually, this is linked when you were saying that, you know, Pakistan hasn't built his case. Pakistan's never good at building his case, which is the problem. I mean, we have, you know, a report from the White House to Congress talking about, you know, sentences such as, you know, that Al-Qaeda is still present, that there is a global um, threat uh, from Al-Qaeda being based still in Pakistan. I mean, they're never good, for example, at giving a, an assessment of the war so far, never good at giving an assessment of this is the solid baseline that we're talking about. That doesn't mean that it isn't out there. I, I just don't think that they're very good at responding. And what you often have is the army saying, um, now here is a PowerPoint presentation, you know, let's look at these numbers one, two, and three. It's, it's not what should be out there. And I sometimes get the impression on my travels that, frankly speaking, he who can talk good, can write clearly, shouts the loudest, tends to get believed. Not always uh, based on evidence. One very last point, which is that you talked about, you know, um, Quetta Shura. I don't know if there's a Quetta Shura. You know, I have heard about that. Um, yeah, there, there is, no, I, I don't know. One, 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 the point I wanted to make, I don't know, Marvin, I'm sure I don't know any more than you know, but what. I'm aware, of course, that there are no drone attacks in Quetta. But what I'm also aware about is that there have been special operations going on. We hear something about that now, but they have been going on for some time. Yes. It is uh, one addition. There is also uh, evidence. Uh, it is very difficult to produce evidence of intelligence operations in a court of law and make the giant step. But there is evidence, and when I asked uh, my sources why this evidence was not put out, I was told that the Indians have been shown this evidence. Uh, do recall that in Shamul Sheikh joint declaration, India accepted the Pakistani point of Balochistan and not without reason. Uh, the other uh, issue was that they said that because the relations with Karzai have moved, uh, towards the positive side, we do not want to come up with something uh, in public which would embarrass it. Uh, and since I've written this in black and white, let me also say this here, that in uh, October 2009, when I was meeting uh, Mr. Richard Amshaj in his Virginia office, he was also there, I think, in that meeting, and he said that uh, uh, we had information that Kazai's brother was running guns into the Rajasthan in collusion with the Indian. With so I, I don't know what kind of evidence we are asking for because if uh, we want to for, you know, place it uh, uh, as like uh, down for a trial before a jury, maybe we want yeah, to win the case. Uh, so, yeah, okay. Oh, oh, okay. This is a side issue. I brought it up only because uh, it involves us. It really is not the central issue. There's no question that India uh, has an interest here. Uh, I, do get, I do get the feeling of exaggeration though, uh, when what happens is if India has a hospital somewhere, this becomes a consulate. Uh, and so you hear about 15 consulates uh, and so on. If India has a road crew, that's another. Now, consulates are there to collect as collection. There's no consulate that doesn't have lines and needs. So that, no, that's not so. Uh, the real issue is whether that makes a difference here. Whether the Indian involvement, to whatever level it is, makes a difference in, in, in perpetuating this insurgency. Uh, my information tells me that the overwhelming support for the Baluch struggle comes from the Baluch diaspora. It's coming like it is coming for, for others, it's coming from the Gulf. Uh, so uh, we may say this, but whether it, that in itself is an important factor or not, I question. All right. Thank you. Um, 
I think all of you would agree that this is uh, probably the most absorbing and informative discussion um, that, that we've had in a long time on, on this subject. Um, we have a few minutes to have questions. And what I'll do is I'll just uh, acknowledge you and then there'll be a mic that comes to you. Please hold it very close so that the, the webcast can, can, can take off. And I'll just, in the order I saw them. Can I go uh, to you, sir? I'm Nasser, um, actually from uh, Baluchistan, but I'm not a Baluch, I'm Pashtun. Uh, first of all, I would say I really find this ironic that uh, this conflict is a conflict between an occupying nation and occupied nation, a Punjab as occupier and Baluchistan as and Baluch as occupied nation. And I find this really ironic that there's no one represent, representing Baluch in this uh, panel. I mean, entire North America, you couldn't find any single Baluch. I mean, there's three of you sitting representing Punjab. But anyways. Um, I'm, I'm not. Uh, actually, but. Well, you all represent the center of the Punjab, anyway. Can we get a question? The question, my question is first question is from uh, Shazadi. You said if there's insurgency in Baluchistan, it will uh, destabilize Afghanistan further, and there can't be stability in Afghanistan if there's insurgency in Baluchistan. There was no insurgency in uh, the Pashtunkhwa and Khyber Pashtunkhwa, and the parts of Pashtuns, and there is no insurgency from Pashtun nationalists, but Talib, Taliban found sanctuary and they are protected. And we hear this day and night and every day in the international media, they are protected by Pakistani intelligence agencies and Pakistani army. So how can you say that Baluch nationalism and Baluch insurgency will further um, okay. uh, help that? And, and I have a second question from... You know, from let me just go one at a time because there are a lot of hands. If there is time, okay. I'll come back to you. Thank you very much. Would you like to comment? Look, it, it's, it's as simple as this. Instability in one area which joins another area makes that area unstable. We know that from what's happened in KPK. On the KPK issue, I mean, you know, that's a that's a huge issue. I, I really, you know, would need a, a, another whole seminar to deal with that. You don't really want to believe everything that you read in the media. That's the first thing. Second thing is that this was an issue that came up actually in the conference that I, I mentioned that we were talking about, that Marvin and I were at, um, with this constant push about North Waziristan. Everything that's going on is going on in North Waziristan. And the point that I made there is the simple one, which is that almost half of the drones, if not more, that are actually currently targeting um, the Fata areas are actually targeting North Waziristan. Places like that that here have been bombed to the Stone Age continue to be bombed. So it's not as if there's actually not it's not as if there's actually nothing going on there. You know there is, but the whole issue about what's going on in the tribal areas is a big question. Okay, um, let me. I, I've seen all hands. I will come to you. Just let me take it in order, and please make it questions. We're only you know very very short of time here, Dennis. <coughs> uh, Dennis Cooks from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, I wonder if you, if all the panel would address what seems to me is a key issue, uh, how well is the federal government doing in patching things up with the Baluch? In other words, there's a problem. You've given varying degrees of assessments of what the problem is, but there clearly is a problem. And how is the government of Pakistan doing? Question mark. Um. I apologize, you keep on hearing weird noises in this room. We are new to this building, so I also have no clue what's happening. Who would like to uh, take this? Okay. Um, they're trying to do certain things, but my problem with their approach is that I think they need to pull in the, uh, the sub-nationalists, the groups, BLA, BRA, BLUF, you know, the Nashkare, uh, all of these groups need to be pulled in. And without any preconditions for talks. Now, of course, uh, Dr. Allah Nazar had an interview with Delhi Times just about, I think, a couple of days ago, in which he says very clearly that he's not prepared to talk, and secession is the only option. Now, that's the kind of thing that the federal government will face, and the provincial government will face, but that's precisely the challenge that they need to take up politically. And then, of course, as far as the security part of it is concerned, uh, no state would allow uh, itself to be undermined this way. But 
that in and of itself should not prevent the federal or the provincial government from taking political measures to pull in these people and talk to them. If you wanted to see me afterwards, <laughs> what I can do, what I was going to say was that what I have here, which, which may interest you and probably go some extent to answer your question, is the whole list of what the constitutional package for Balochistan was all about, what the government announced in a huge fanfare and said that you, we have an, an all-party uh, parliamentary <coughs> committee that has dealt with that, we've built the consensus, and here is the package that is going to address all these issues. What I can't tell you, and, and maybe Sherry Rahman, the minister, was here this morning, although that was that was off the record, but you might have been able to say you know, how far the government's got on well, this. How, how, what do you think? I'd really like to get your opinions on how well the government of Pakistan um, is. Can, can I think very briefly, this, this government isn't doing anything well. <laughs> so <laughs> that it can handle this problem along with the others, I, I think, speaks for itself. But perhaps a longer discussion later. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Let the mic come because we're on, online as well. Yeah, my name is Kami Bhatt. I write for the Pakistani Spectator. I agree with Harrison that since the inception of Pakistan, Pakistani army is brutalizing so poor. Uh, uh, no, okay. no, no, but okay, my question is it's really injustice that you do not have any Indian friend or Masti Khan, my brother here, because they are the people who represent. L look, What's India has as much concern about Balochistan as Pakistan has about Kashmir. I'm a Kashmiri. I think. India should get its butt out of Kashmir and Pakistan should get its butt out of Balochistan. Okay, my question is, why don't you have somebody from okay. India, why don't you have Masti Khan who, who has devoted his life, okay. why don't you have some Ra's person, I, I, people understand what is Ra, it's like ISI and, uh, uh, and CIA. Ra is supporting okay, Balochistan I've got your question, I've got your question. Okay. I'll answer this in my closing remarks. Thanks. Thank you. I think Ra uh, gave very little money I, to my I brother Masti Khan. I've got your question, sir, please. <clears throat> My name is Andrew. I oh, no. my name is my name is Andrew Iva. I was formerly the director of the Federation for American Afghan Action. Uh, Mr. Hyder said there is no insurgency. There is trouble in Balochistan. I would just like uh, Shazadi's and Marvin's assessment whether there is an insurgency or not. Okay. Okay. Marvin, so, and, you know, look, uh, uh, Marvin, Mike, because the people. And what I think we're, we're talking about semantics here. You know, it, depending on how you view the comfort, you've got a different term for it. Okay. So I don't think that's an that answer. I, I don't really have much to add with that. You have insurgent groups. Some people call it an insurgency. Some people say, you know, it's. I, I mean, I, I agree with Martin. Um, I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to answer yours very quickly, but I'm going to say, yes, the government isn't doing very much. Um, do you want to say something on the insurgency since you're the culprit here? <laughs> 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 it's century, yeah, century about the nature of the conflict itself, and frankly, in terms, I mean, it's a, it's a strange way of putting it, but it is about how much the the anti-state uh, adversary can do. Uh, it, it's about quantity. It's about frequency. It's about the lethality of what the other side can do. Uh, which would uh, perhaps uh, uh, allow someone to put a tag on it in terms of whether it's an insurgency or whether it's it's uh, it's armed trouble, uh, whether it is sporadic terrorist attacks. Uh, in some ways, yes, I would agree with uh, with Mahal that it is about semantics, but one also needs to put some kind of quantity and some kind of lethality or it to uh, figure out whether what is going on in Balochistan is essentially an insurgency. And, and perhaps one can compare it with what is happening in Tabak Pakumpar to figure out whether uh, which one of the two conflicts can actually be, uh, be called an insurgency. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Madiha. I'm a graduate student uh, and Pakistani. And I do agree that Pakistan needs to be united rather than separated. As we can see even here, there's a lot of he said, Question, she, he said, she said going on. So um, I was going to ask the dialogues that you've suggested, uh, would there be any kind of advocacy or any kind of, uh, you know, thing done to unite Pakistan to talk about maybe more development side, you uh, know, uh, uh, Who would like to take this? Mr. Adder is busy with his library, but... Uh, 
But I, I, I'm, I'm going to sure. pass this over to um, Giles Hepburn in a moment. But I, I see it really that if you're, what, where are you? Dialogue, talking is always good. You can't achieve anything unless you talk. But talking has to deal with the four key areas, under development, um, and it's huge. Um, it's so huge that some areas, frankly speaking, when my travels looked to me as if it was, you know, 12th century Arabia. It, it's, we're talking that level of underdevelopment. Criminal justice system, as I said in my uh, remarks, absolutely central. You, you have to ha be on top of the law and order situation. Um, foreign interference, these issues will revolve. We've, we've seen some of them raised here, very important. And lastly, to actually address the, the grievances and the human rights issues. Yeah, well, uh, there are multiple fault lines. This is not the only one. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, when it comes to governments, uh, there are vacuums even in, in, in the Punjab, in, in urban areas, even in the city of Lahore. For instance, you've got the small local chains, which work very, very nicely. But they also benefit the absence of governance at, at one level. And whether is there some kind of way in which those local chains can actually subsume into the larger national chain uh, is, is an issue that, of course, is being debated. Uh, there are too many questions, but very few answers. Okay. Uh, I want a last show of hands. I have, two, I have two people here. Is there anybody else? I'm going to cap it here because we're running out of time. Okay, sir, and then uh, the gentleman. Can we get a microphone here? And we just need uh, one minute questions because we're almost out of time. Uh, I am Baluch and I am from Baluchistan. My humble request to the USIP, please don't invite Pakistanis to talk on Baluchistan. My question is to Mr. Wa Wa Marvin Weinbaum. Uh, Mr. Weinbaum, mm, uh, I would like to request you, the United States is uh, supporting the rebels in Libya, quote unquote rebels. The West is, has supported the rebels in Ivory Coast uh, will the United States and the West please realize the gravity of the human rights situation in Baluchistan and support our independence? Okay, thank you. Uh, can we get the question then? Sure. Uh, my name is Wilson Lee. I'm with the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, everyone sort of mentioned uh, the need for a political solution, but um, I was struck by the fact that no one talked about uh, political parties or the uh, the government, uh, provincial government in Baluchistan. They talked about the, the insurgents and uh, the military, sort of the armed factions. And I was just wondering if I can get your assessment about uh, whether, you know, the, the nationalist parties who didn't contest the last elections but um, still remain a viable uh, political platform for mobilization, whether they have any role in this uh, okay. resolving this I, issue. I want to go in reverse order from the, the two questions and anything else you want to add, the last word. Um, well, I, I did. I did mention that. I, I did mention that uh, there is interest in this country, and not great interest, but there's been some press coverage of, uh, of these uh, uh, atrocities, which which, and, uh, you know, which uh, apparently have occurred. Uh, but uh, it, whether the U.S. has a strategic, a vital strategic interest in the Baluch struggle, insurgency, whatever. Uh, I, I started off by saying no, and I, and I thought I gave some reasons to why that might be the case. You want to take two questions and an ask what if there is. But 30 seconds, please. Yeah. Well, this is Sorry. exactly the kind of Baroid sentiment that I was talking about, which uh, which makes it difficult to dialogue with the Baroid. My point, I want to Sir, can, please. <laughs> You should have it there, man. That is just okay, can, can we please finish this? I will answer your question. I've already said that. But which is exactly the kind of challenge that has to be taken up uh, and, and addressed, which is precisely why I said that uh, these groups need to be pulled in. Uh, as, as far as so your question about the, the political parties and groups, yes, there are mainstream political parties which are part of the government which is the Pakistan People's Party and the Evil Q and other, other parties, the JYF. Uh, some of the, the, uh, the Baloch uh, parties did not participate uh, as in BKM, Mahmoud uh, Kamili, Amami Party and others. Uh, we are likely to have next elections. My own assessment is uh, March 2012 onwards, there will be early elections. 
and hopefully uh, those parties will contest the elections. And to become part of the, the process within the provincial parliament also and also the federal parliament. Sir? I'm not sure why you think that the Baloch are not supported internationally. They certainly are. And Akbar Bukhti had enough arms before he was killed to arm a small African state. Okay. Um, may I say that this has been a tough one for me? I don't know about the panelists and, and the audience. Uh, uh, but, but I think I partly expected this. Uh, let me just sum up by, by saying a couple of things. First of all, I think one thing that comes out of this, to my mind at least, as, as an analyst, is again and again, there is no substitute for ground knowledge. And you know, there's so little of that, unfortunately, we talk so much about this region. But if you really get down to the nitty gritty, uh, Ijaz uh, in some ways has you know, even lost me somewhere. And I think I know this country. So um, I want to thank the panelists for really bringing out, uh, all, all four of you, um, uh, something, something new uh, today. Um, as far as this idea of what to do and how to move forward, I think it, to me, if I summarize this, it becomes fairly clear that the way to move forward is political dialogue, which is something, at least on paper, that the government has put. And um, while I think there is, of course, a clear disagreement, Mr. Harrison took the other line. I think the other three were of the opinion um, that the Federation of Pakistan, it's in their interest and the interest of others to see this region uh, stabilize as quickly as possible. Um, and so all forces uh, need to move in that direction, and perhaps much quicker than, uh, than they have. Um, on this question of why we have this panel and not others, let me tell you, there's, if this job was tough, my last week was tougher. And it's very interesting that this is one of the events where no side is happy. No, no single side is happy. Everybody has come back to me with a complaint, some even official. So um, I, I just want to say, USIP, to be very clear, is an independent think tank. We do more events, perhaps, than anybody in town. And you can go back and look in the past year. We've had all sorts of people come here and present perspectives. And a lot of you have, have attended it, uh, events and would know this. Um, let me also add that I am not here to say that we, when I say we have a diverse view every time, that we cover all views. Right? I mean, the, it's, it's impossible. And so I am going to upset people. So if I, you know, there are certain things which, of course, one needs to improve on. One can talk about more. I have nothing wrong with that. Pakistan but please, sir, Pakistan please, overrepresented. Okay, please understand that when I or USIP or any think tank is putting together something, there are various things that we are reaching out to, looking at. And if you say Pakistan is overrepresented, I'm sorry, but. In my let mind, me, and let, I will, let me just say no, no, one. Yes, right, my friend. Balochistan, yes, Balochistan, you should Balochistan have, yes, sir. is part of okay. Pakistan. Okay, okay, sir. Therefore, uh, Mr. Yes, Justice yes. means you should have Mr. Kumar there, who said can Pakistan I just finish? Sixteen to kill innocence. I'm sorry. Then. I'm sorry. I cannot. Yes, sir, am I right, Mr. Kumar? Mr. Bhatt, can I please finish? Because uh, I actually have the last word. Finally, um, <laughs> the point here is very simple. I am not. There's. If anybody is offended, I'm sorry. I thought this was a fairly good panel. There were people who had been there. Uh, there are people who are known, uh, who've written extensively. If there is somebody who doesn't agree with this, that's exactly why I think <coughs> I, I hope somebody else does another event. Good luck to them. But I thought this was a great panel. Please join me in, in thanking you.